Welcome back, honors. All right. So, you all had a fantastic day in class today. Absolutely killing it. I loved some of the ideas. I loved your intensity. I loved how y'all were like, seemed to be really getting engaged and interested in everything. Uh, only critique I have is definitely some of my kids in the back. Definitely raise your hand a little bit more, right? Let me hear you. Let me like get some of those questions, answer it a little bit, keep that engagement flow going. Because I'm a big proponent of not having my desks in rows, and so I am struggling with that a little bit. So if you're back in the back, get your hand up a little bit. Let me see you, okay? So big things going forward. We talked a lot about Paleolithic to Neolithic, the positives and negatives of collectivized agriculture, how that's going to lead to civilizations, and we're going to keep reviewing some of that stuff tomorrow when we talk about, like, what modern-day humans we are, because we didn't even really finish going over the warm-up. Um, but we are going to get into a little bit more stuff going forward. So, big thing is, though, what we're getting into now, Mesopotamia, all right? So, Mesopotamia, the very first civilization, the cradle of civilization, if you will. A lot of people refer to it as. It's a very obscure kind of thing to talk about because it's not a civilization in the kind of cohesive sense that you think of a civilization as being, all right? So a lot of y'all think of like ancient civilizations as being something more along the lines of like ancient Egypt, a centralized collective culture and area that actually rules independently in and of itself. Whereas Mesopotamia is actually a whole different ballgame. But it's okay because they also present a lot of super interesting things, super interesting things to analyze and understand because they're the very first group of people to actually collectivize. So let's go ahead and get into it, though, all right? Let's go ahead and talk about the earliest civilization, the Fertile Crescent, right? So let's talk about what that word means, Fertile Crescent, all right? So let's talk about what the word Mesopotamia means. But what it really is, Mesopotamia, for all intents and purposes, is the earliest of all of the civilizations. Beginning around 4000 BC, okay, the earliest of all civilizations to form permanent settlements. There is a phenomenal historian and evolutionary biologist by the name of Jared Diamond who actually goes into a heavy amount of understanding of Southwest Asia, which is the Middle East, right? And how they were the cradle of civilization and their introduction of collectivized agriculture and how that's going to be a major game changer in the collectivization of people and the actual creation of civilizations. So to give you an understanding, the word Mesopotamia actually is of Greek origin. And that word itself means between two rivers. So even the word Mesopotamia denotes its geographical location, okay? It is in present-day Iraq and Mesopotamia particularly refers to the city-states that fall within the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which run from the northwest uh, point of Iraq all the way through, and then they dump out into the, I believe it's the Arabian Sea? Uh, yep, yeah. the Arabian, no, or is it the Persian Sea? Hold on, let me check. Oh yeah, dumps out into the Persian Gulf, all right? And then actually creates this area of fertile land. These two rivers do, right? The Tigris and the Euphrates River. River valley civilizations are the game when we're talking about a lot of these ancient civilizations. River valleys provided seasonal flooding, better soil, movement of goods, irrigation opportunities, which we'll talk about here in a minute, right? Now, going forward, though, the Mesopotamian civilization in and of itself is going to kind of last for about 3,000 years, give or take. Uh, we kind of begin it with the Mesopotamian civilizations of Sumer and as well as Babylon rising up to prominence. And then we tend to kind of end the Mesopotamian civilization, or civilization around the conquests of Persia and then going forward into the, uh, the Muslim and Islamic kingdoms actually rising up and taking over that, uh, that expansive area. And then also the Ottomans later on, but those are also Ottoman Turks who were Muslim. So anyway, last for about 3,000 years. And its people were the very first to irrigate fields, devise a system of writing, develop mathematics, and invent the wheel, which is really important. And they also learned to work with metal, all right? That metal, of course, being bronze, all right? Something important to remember is those earliest metals being bronze and other types of rudimentary metals like copper, for example. But let's really quick talk about, oh, wait, nope, let's go ahead. There we go. All right, so let's talk about geography a little bit, and then we'll talk eventually a little bit more about that irrigation process, right? So, and why it's so important to the development of civilizations in total, because we still, to this day, use irrigation systems that were originally constructed 4,000 years ago, right? So, anyway, we're 4,000 BC. All right, now, anyway, going forward, though, this is the Fertile Crescent. Why do they call it the Fertile Crescent? Oh, 
because you see all this green area right here? That is the land, the fertile land created by, excuse me, created by seasonal flooding as well as the river valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, right? So going into this though, as you can see, this green swath of land actually makes a crescent moon shape, hence the fertile crescent, right? As wise referred to as the fertile crescent due to the fact that it actually was extremely fertile, extremely tillable, and a very, 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 uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Plentiful in its nature for producing agricultural goods, right? So they had several different types of crops that we'll talk about here in a second. But the big thing to understand is looking at this area in the world, um, Iraq and Syria and uh, Saudi Arabia, as well as Kuwait, tend to be areas that you believe to associate with little rainfall, hot, dry climates, windstorms, leaving muddy river valleys in the winter, catastrophic flooding of rivers in the spring, soil containing little to no mineral nutritional value, and also very little stone or timber resources, right? When we think of Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, uh, modern day Israel, you usually kind of immediately think geographically of desert-like climates, right? And you're not that far off. There are hot, dry climates, little rainfall, windstorms, like we were just talking about. All these issues do play into effect, especially this one, the catastrophic flooding of the rivers, right? Rivers typically in Mesopotamia flooded would oftentimes destroy riverbanks, move uh, local vegetation and trees and forests around, creating some issues for Mesopotamians to actually have to deal with. But those rivers would eventually leave behind some material known as silt and would actually reinvigorate the soil, which is great. We'll talk about that much more heavily when we get into Egypt. Uh, however, all this stuff might have been tough. But you know what? Why live in Mesopotamia if it's so bad? A lot of it has to do with these bad boys, right? So you have to understand the Tigris and Euphrates River valleys are albeit the surrounding areas, yes, very desert-like, very dry, very hot, very little rainfall, low timber resources, all these things, but they also were home to a plentiful amount of these natural levees, all right? So natural levees are these embankments, all right, produced by a buildup of sediment over thousands of years. Y'all know exactly what a levee is being from Louisiana, right? The levees of which that hold the river back, okay? So these natural levees, as the river would flood continuously, would leave behind these large deposits of sediment, creating fertile soil down here at the bottom of silt, and then also a natural embankment that would keep the, huge, the largest part of the river retained. The other amazing thing is it allowed you to cut into this natural levee creating an irrigation system, right? So these natural levees became a geographic necessity for the ability to actually live in the Mesopotamian area, right? As you can see with this little cross section, right, you have the location of the town on top of this natural levee that is formed by those springtime floods. Uh, then you have also the fertile soil that is actually made of silt and sediment from those springtime floods. And this natural levee would create a high, safe floodplain. And they were the thing that made irrigation and canal construction very easy. So let's go ahead and turn over here real quick. And we'll kind of take two seconds to talk about like what irrigation is right so let's say hypothetically speaking right let's say that this is i'll make you a little bit bigger and we'll just kind of talk about irrigation right so this is where we're going to take a second to talk about irrigation right so irrigation is a very very important process actually invented by the sumerians um and <clears throat> one of the things that made it possible for the mesopotamians to actually have a civilization so let's say hypothetically we've got Jenna, right? Here's Jenna, and she's just chilling. There's her hair and stuff, right? Jenna is a sesame seed farmer, right? Who actually, surprisingly enough, uh, sesame seeds were a pretty plentiful crop actually in this area at the time. Now, unfortunately though, this area where her farm is, is a solid distance away from the river itself. And here's our natural levee embankment, right? She's gonna be going down towards the fertile land area on this side, right? Now, the unfortunate part about it is Jenna cannot and does not have the ability to continually walk this distance back and forth to farm large amounts, right? So instead, what they're going to do is they're going to use three different things. They're going to use a system of, hold on one second. There we go. 
Uh, they're going to use a system of dikes, ditches, and dams, which I know from any parent listening to this right now sounds absolutely awful I'm saying these things. But this series of dikes, ditches, and dams would actually make it so they could cut into these natural levees and allow the water to flow freely to places like Jenna's sesame seed farm, right? Because let's talk about what these three things are really quick. A dike, which is one of the most important like properties of the irrigation system, is a door that could be opened and closed to regulate water flow coming from that natural levee. A ditch, of course, just being a simple kind of geographic canal to actually funnel the water towards the um, agricultural sector. And then a dam, of course, being something that could be used to block off water flow to cause a buildup so it would make it easier to actually channel back to the fields themselves, right? So, and you're also going to have really hear these things talked about, things like Hammurabi's Code and civic responsibility and uh, government and politics within Mesopotamia due to the fact that maintaining of your irrigation system was massively important to the survival of the community, right? But that's what an irrigation system is. This very simple rudimentary thing of just bringing water from a distant place to another, okay? So those natural levees, though, provide an easeability for creating irrigation systems, right? So also, these natural levees are gonna provide protection, right? Protection, protection from flooding that has occurred over time, right? Flooding that has occurred in other areas of Mesopotamia without these natural levees can be catastrophic and would destroy settlements if they were actually made anywhere close by, okay? So also, the surrounding swamps that are gonna be present off of the banks of these natural levees are going to be full of fish and waterfowl and the only life source that it actually exists in hot, dry, arid climates, okay? Reeds are going to provide food for sheep and goats, which happens to be one of the biggest domesticatable animals for the Mesopotamian people. I know what I said earlier that there's the big three for Americans, which is swine, cow, chicken, but there also are the big nine in totality. It's dog. The big nine domesticated animals are dog, cat, cow, swine, chicken, horse, I think donkey, and then two types of camel, all right? So, oh no, goat camel, yeah. So anyway, reeds are gonna provide this massive amount of food for sheep and goats, so they have something to easily herd them with, and then reeds are also gonna be used as building resources and materials. So these natural levees are key for the Mesopotamians to be able to exist, right? So history of Mesopotamia, just so I can give you a little snapshot of like where these people came from, where they're going, and things like that, they existed over several centuries, okay? Many different people lived in this area, creating a collection of independent states. So something else you need to understand. Egypt was a politically centralized, focused in one area, ruled from one city, culturally ubiquitous kingdom, okay? As in, Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt shared some similar attributes, including religion and mummification and writing styles and paper making and things like that, architecture. Whereas Mesopotamians, on the other hand, did share some similar cultural aspects, maybe a writing system and things like that. However, Mesopotamia is a region, right? Let's say hypothetically we jump back real quick and we go back to the, there we go. As you can see, Mesopotamia was home to several different city-states. And these city-states would fluctuate in power, right? And they would eventually be able to rise up in enough power to take over neighboring city-states and impose their will or their culture. And then eventually one of the other city-states would rise up and then retake over, over that area. So we're going to talk about something like for the big Mesopotamian peoples, right? Now, here we go. There we go. So the four big Mesopotamian peoples that existed are Sumer or the Sumerians, which is the southern area, including a couple of cities like city states like Ur, for example, or Ur, U R, Ur. Like it sounds very aggressive, I know. Uh, but Sumer or Sumerian, you actually have heard of Sumerians before when you've heard of the story of the Good Samaritan, right? The Good Samaritan, as then the Good Sumerian. Now that is the southern part, and they were in power from about 3,500 BC to about 2,000 BC, and then you're gonna have a rise up of the Akkadian who are so pointless. The Akkadians showed up for about the literally less than, or just a little over 200 years, less than 200 years actually. So from about 2340 to about 2180 BC, 
Okay, so the Akkadians, their biggest attribute being Sargon the Great, one of their leaders, right? Then you've got Babylon or the Kingdom of Babylon. These two regions were unified in 1830 to 1500 and then 650 to 500. We will talk about this a little bit later on, the 650 to 500 piece a little bit later, because you actually technically could go Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Neo-Babylonian, right? Because the Babylonians came back for a short amount of time, but then the Assyrians eventually came back as well later on also, right? So this is just to kind of give you an outline of Mesopotamia is a region home to several different city-states that have existed throughout time, all right? Now, the biggest thing that they devoted to the, all the history and all the Western civilizations and all civilizations, period, has to do with their development of writing systems, okay? Mesopotamians and their development of writing is hands down and by far their greatest gift to civilization. The very first people to ever create a writing system, of course, were the Mesopotamians, right? And the Mesopotamians are going to create a system of writing that no one had ever seen because no one had ever used writing before. And writing is also really important because why did writing arrive? Writing was developed mainly just so government officials could keep account of crops being grown. It was a system of accounting and a system of, like, actually keeping tally of the crops needed to be grown to keep the civilization alive, right? So just so you understand, writing takes several different forms, right? You got pictograms, which are pictures that show a meeting. You have ideograms or logograms, which are signs that represent words or ideas. Like an, idea, like an example of an ideogram or a logogram is like a question mark, right? Which represents a question itself or just an exclamation point. Or for example, the money symbol, which represents money and the concept of money. That ideogram or logogram is a good example of a sign that represents a word. And then you have phonetics, and phonetics we'll get into later, and phonetics are systems where signs actually represent words. Other like linguists like to call them alphabetic uh, systems of writing or alphanumeric systems of writing. Uh, so we're just going to call them phonetics for the purpose of talking about the Phoenicians later. Now the phonetics is what most writing systems are based off of now. Whereas the Mesopotamian system was actually kind of a mixture of ideograms and pictograms, right? So it was actually kind of this odd mixture of the two. Now it is the greatest contribution of Mesopotamia to Western civilizations, of course, was their writing system, okay? Now why is it so important? Because this writing system now allows for the transmission of knowledge, the codification of laws and records to facilitate trade and farming, just like we just talked about. It now gives them the ability to record crop yields, taxation, uh, necessary equipment, surplus numbers, uh, tributes that need to be paid to the religious community, all kinds of stuff, right? So Sumerians are going to write their new writing system, though, not on paper, right? So I know that you're right now probably sitting there writing these notes down on paper. Sumerians didn't do that. Sumerians actually did their writing on clay tablets. And what they would do is they would take clay off the bottom of the riverbed, right? And then they would take it over a log or another stone, and they would slap it down, and they would edge out a tablet, and then they would use a reed that had a wedge shape to it. Because you have to understand the word of their writing system is called cuneiform. Cuneiform literally means wedge shape. And they would take a reed that had that kind of wedge shape or that greater than symbol shape right there, and they would actually use that to write in their accounting system in their cuneiform symbol, right? Or cuneiform symbols. And then they would allow that tablet to dry out in the sun, and bang, they now have a system of writing, okay? Now, the only people that were actually trained in these writing systems were known as scribes. Scribes are the only ones that I could actually read. They write and serve as priests, record keepers, accountants, a very, very, very high echelon job. It is the only thing that one could be educated in during these time periods, right? Now, as society evolved, the first form of writing was developed known as, again, cuneiform. Cuneiform spread to Persia for a time and to Egypt for a time and actually became a vehicle of growth for other civilizations. And some believe that Egyptians based their cuneiform or their uh, hieroglyphic alphabet off of early attempts to try and adopt a cuneiform style of writing for themselves, right? So also with this, it's going to introduce different types of education because Mesopotamian education is now going to be super complicated because their writing system 
No one actually necessarily understood it. The only people that could read were other scribes, right? And the only people that knew how to write were other scribes. Using this information to uh, try and send information to one another about different affairs of state, right? So scribes, since it was so complicated, they had to go to school and study for many, many years, right? And a scribe, what they are is a person who copies documents before printing in our modern era. But during this time period, it was someone who was trained to read, write, and transcribe information, right? So the unfortunate part about it is scribes during this time were always wealthy, male, and very, 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 very subjugated from society, right? To be a scribe in the Sumerian society, you had to be wealthy and to be a man, right? So this is another kind of downfall of that Neolithic agricultural revolution is we're creating this differentiation of people in social classes, right? So scribes had to be wealthy and male. Sorry, ladies, okay? Scribe training was very, very strict as well. Scribes often were caned as a punishment. If you messed up when you were writing in scribe school in Mesopotamian education in Sumeria, if you messed up, you could often be caned or hit with a reed cane. Absolutely wild, right? So anyway, now other subjects that were taught in these schools were things like botany, okay, math, because they were actually used to like keep accounting systems for crop yields, botany, so they could actually be able to record different types of plants in their crop yields, and also linguistics and literature, which we'll talk about in class, okay? Now these schools set a standard for all the city-states in the area and even our current day systems of education as well, right? So this is a very important product to be able to understand kind of this origin of education, the origin of writing systems, the origin of irrigation, and then further on we're going to be able to talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is super cool, and then we're going to be able to talk about some of the different uh, reigning kingdoms in these areas, but we're going to go ahead and cut it there for today, because I feel like I've already given you guys a lot, but I will see you guys soon. Talk to y'all later.